The scripture reading for today is Acts is from Acts 20, verse 24. But I did not account my life of any, any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. Okay, so good to be back here. Okay, <laughs> As you know, I, I was not here last Sunday because I was attending two different conferences. And one was a pastoral uh, renewal retreat at the Billy Graham Training Center in Asheville, North Carolina. And I'm sure you heard about Black Mountain, right? Black Mountain. So it's somewhere there. It's, it's a beautiful, uh, a really wonderful place. And so my wife and I had this incredible opportunity to, you know, be selected. You know, they, they do kind of lotteries or something like that. And then we... You know, we applied sometime last year and then we got selected by the grace of God, as well as all your support and prayers. We will be able to just attend this three day long program, which is all inclusive. OK, and we only have to pay thirty five dollars for a registration fee, but that covers up all the meals, wonderful meals and wonderful shelter. And also we can hear this, you know, wonderful speaker um, giving us lectures and seminars. Um. So their goal, the, it's a run by Billy Graham Training Center, and their goal is to strengthen and support pastors and pastor spouse. And I think they are doing a wonderful, excellent job because that's what we feel right now, right? We feel renewed, rejuvenated, and you know we are more excited, you know, to, for doing God's ministry. And can you tell it? Amen, right? <laughs> so um, praise God for that, and again, thank you for your prayers. And right after we came back from um, this retreat, Santos and Andy and I, uh, we attended the Nine March with Kender. Uh, it's, it is hosted by the church called the Capitol Hill Baptist Church in D.C., only four blocks, um, four blocks behind the Capitol building. And um, so one of our church visions this year is to empower our lay people to serve God and serve his church more enthusiastically. And I explained this um, a while ago. The enthusiasm literally means God within me. Say it with me, enthusiasm. Meaning God within me. You know, if God is really in you, how can you not be enthusiastic, right? And so we try to help our church members to, to, to have more God in them, to be more enthusiastic, you know, worshiping God and following Jesus Christ. So I was extremely happy to see Andy and Santos. They signed up for this. And um, and I, you know, just being together at, at the first day, you know, sitting in this room together, uh, you know, my joy really exploded. Um, although Andy could not make it, you know, for the rest of the session because of his severe foot pain, but bless his heart, okay, bless his heart. Though he was there, you know, uh, with us, and and uh, this is something that I would like to bring more, you know, bring this more opportunities so that you can. Have God more, you know, it can be a conference, it can be seminars, it can be revival, whatever. Okay, I, I want to bring this more to you and our church. I believe we have the support every way possible so that everybody, you know, here, we may learn and grow and fan the flame in our hearts. Just like the scripture goes, whoever will be given more, you know, and they will have an abundance. You know, whoever has it, you know, whoever has this passion, but we're willing to grow more. God will grow, you know, help you to grow more and have a, a abundance. So speaking of the nine marks, we came there. Um, so I knew it before attending this conference. I knew that this was designed to um, help and, and and train pastors and church people, church leaders to help their ministry grow healthily and and stronger. But I did not know that their schedule will be this intense. Okay, it was very intensive course of training, starting from early in the morning and, you know, ends um, pretty late in the night. For instance, on Sunday, you know, I had to start joining them from the Sunday, early Sunday morning, um, um, the Sunday school and then worship service and then breakout sessions. And then they had another meeting at 9 p.m. So all the staffs and pastors and elders, along with all the nine weekend participants, we gathered like hundreds of them gathered in this basement and talking about reviewing their worship, their services, their sermons, and things like this. So, you know, on Sunday night, I came home, like, after 11 p.m., 
And then on the following day, they had another session starting at 7.45 a.m. So I had to, you know, leave home like, you know, 6 a.m. or so and things like that. And, you know, and all the staff members, including senior pastors, were there. You know, they are giving lectures one after another. And so I could feel, you know, that's something I really appreciate them. They are willing to help. They are willing to give and share what they know so that they can help other Christians, other pastors, you know, to be to grow healthy and to grow stronger. So that's my biggest takeaway. You know, they they believe in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it means we have to help other Christians to grow healthily. Now, there's no individual or individually contract Christian. If you want to be a serious Christ follower, you have to be more serious how you can help other Christian brothers and sisters grow and you know, stand firm and things like that. In the same way, in order to we want to build our church healthily and you know stronger, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to do it for ourselves only. We're not here just to glorify our church, right? We are here to glorify God. So why don't we help other churches around us so that they can stand firm and, and grow healthily so that we can all together glorify God? So that's one thing I really learned and appreciated from their ministries because I feel like they're really setting a good example, you know, um, of serving and helping and building other churches, you know, for the glory of God. And, and that's my hope and prayer that you now we have a new church sign here. Now we are starting new, right? We are building new church now. And the more we build this, you know, somehow our church can help other churches around us to be healthier and stronger so that. You know, we can build God's kingdom, not only here, but in this community. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. So looking back my last week, there are so many things I want to share with you today. But, you know, I'll promise no two-hour worship today, okay? Uh, I feel like I, I was well-fed. You know, I, I feel like I had, I had gained some spiritual weight. Um, but Lord has shown me um, so many great things and made new connections, wonderful connections, which, which will unfold more, I believe. But one of these wonderful things, you know, out of, what, out of all these wonderful things that the Lord has done, if I must pick one, you know, if I had to highlight one thing from all of this, it would be this, which is the title of our sermon today. Say it with me, faithfulness, not success. Faithfulness, not success. Throughout this remarkable week, one word that kept ringing in my heart was the word faithfulness. Mother Teresa famously said, I do not pray for success. I ask for faithfulness. Dr. Crawford Laurie, he was a speaker at the pastoral renewal retreat at Billigram Trans Center. He said, faithfulness is always tragically underrated. But remember, your faithfulness is where God smiles. Think about what it means to be faithful. If you are a faithful person, it means you are reliable. It means you are consistent. For instance, for instance, if you are a faithful student, what does that mean? You are a faithful student. It means you, know, you show up to every class on time, you study hard, and respect your teacher. And your teacher and your peers will, be, will appreciate your faithfulness. And I'm sure all of us here want to have this faithfulness as our character, and that's what other people expect, expect from us too. And that's how we can build and we can make the society a better place. Just imagine this whole society is filled with faithful, reliable, honest, consistent people. And I, I'm thinking of a child. You know, imagine this child has a mom, you know, a mother who wakes up in one morning and, and says, wow, it's a great day. I feel great. So let me pack you a nice lunch. Let me clean up the house. But next morning she says she's like oh i'm so gloomy i'm not gonna do anything you know don't bother me how would this child feel you know, the insecurity this child would feel or you know speaking of the basketball player if you're a coach you don't want a player who scores 70 points in one game but rest of the game for the season he, he can only score five points per game you don't want that kind of player right you want a player who can consistently you know, make a score decently 
because that's the kind of player you can rely on. It applies to our faith journey too. God is not looking for emotional Christians, so to speak. One day, my heart is burning for you. God, I can surrender everything for you. But the next day, your heart became cold and you know, you're living a life as if there's no, you know, there's no Jesus in you. Or God is not looking for super talented Christian or smart Christians. But what God is looking for is faithful Christians. Amen. Remember what Jesus said to a servant in Matthew 25. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. He didn't say, well done, good and successful, fruitful servant. He said, well done. My faithful servant, enter into the joy of, of your master. So again, this word of faithfulness kept coming back to my heart <clears throat> throughout the week. Whether I was in North Carolina in Black Mountain or in Washington, D.C. near Capitol Building. And I have to share this story first with you because I have this confirmation from God. That faithfulness is something that I must address at this very time with you all. Somebody said... Uh, his name is Thomas Long. He's a homiletics uh, professor. He said, preachers are essentially the witness, meaning the preacher is essentially, a, preaching is essentially a movement from listening to telling, beholding to attesting, from seeing to saying, from perceiving to testifying, from being a witness to bearing witness. The preachers who are standing on the pulpit has to, supposed to, just testify what he has taste it and see so that's what i'm gonna share with you today so what did i have tasted and see about this faithfulness it takes us back uh, to my time at the billy graham training center so on the second day they gave us this long afternoon break and if you remember like so not this week but a week before tuesday it was a gorgeous weather right it was one fine weather and and um and I learned that they have a nice you know they have a hiking trail behind the facility and I heard it was a six mile long uh, trail and it will take about uh, three hour you know, just going back and forth so but my wife and I we kind of hesitated you know whether <laughs> we're not sure if we can make this because we know we're kind of out of out of shape and we cannot even Im remember when was our last time we had this long hike. But the weather was so good, and so we were like, "Why not? Let's go for it!" So we packed, uh, we we grabbed the water bottle, some snacks, and just went on. Long story short, we we're still alive, right? <laughs> but it was really hard, you know. We, you know, I, I cannot remember how many times we had to stop. You know, it it wasn't a pleasant six mile long hike. It was, you know, pretty like steep all along. So, um, you know, we had to stop many times, especially my wife, you know, I, I, I ended up carrying her purse, her bag, and I was, I was seriously thinking of carrying her on my back, you know, because there were moments she was like almost passed out. Yeah, that was, oh my gosh. But, um, but this is the highlight of the story, okay? This is the highlight of the story. We were on the way up still, all of a sudden, you know, this thought came to my mind. So I've been keep hearing about this faithfulness. And I'm asking the Lord, so Lord, what do you want me to be faithful for? You know, faithful for what? Could you be more specific? So I was literally asking this question in my mind. At that very moment, Yummy suddenly she stopped and bent down to tie her shoes. And then... um. So I had to stop, you know, um, and what do you do when you had to stop in the middle of the mountain? You look around, right? <laughs> so that's what I did. I looked around while I was still chewing on this question. So what do I need to be faithful for, Lord? But there, behold, <laughs> you know, behind the yummy, there was a little white pole in the mountain. So I looked at it and there was a scripture on this pole and it says Acts 20, 24. <laughs> so I was like, that's interesting, okay? And maybe, maybe that might be God's answer to my this question. So I looked up, I, I grabbed my phone and looked up, and that's the scripture of reading today, okay? What was it? Can we all read this together one more time? But I do not account my life of any value, 
nor as precious to myself, if I only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You know, I almost cried you know, when I just received this word. Indeed, I felt like this is God's answering to my question. You know, this is what it means to be faithful. And I'll dig into more, you know, um, in a moment, what it means to be faithful for. But I wanted to hear this first. I hope you don't take it as, you know, this is your testimony, your per personal te testimony, and has nothing to do with me. I don't, you understand the sermon in, this, in such a way. I truly believe God used me. God used me at that very moment to put me there, to use my time, use my heart, use my legs, and literally, you know, put me in the, on that mountain so that I can witness that word, to bring it down and share with you today. Because God's calling for faithfulness is not just for me, but it's for everyone here. Amen? So what do we need to be faithful for? Let's unpack three things from Acts 20, 24. Number one, God wants you to be faithful to the task. Number two, God wants you to be faithful until the end. Number three, be faithful by God's faithfulness. So number one, God wants you to be faithful to the task. Your task, you have a task. Your task is to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says in this verse, the ministry the Lord has given me is to testify the gospel of the grace of God. When God called you and me, and we should never forget that there is a purpose in this calling, and that is to share the gospel. When God, you know, when Jesus far, you know, first called his first disciples, who were Simon Peter and brother Andrew, the scripture says at the time they were you know, catching fish, casting a net into the sea, for there were fishermen. To these people, Jesus approached and said to them, follow me. But his calling does not end there, right? There's something else. Jesus said, follow me, and then what? I will make you become fishers of men, meaning I will make you an evangelist. Now, I, will, I want you to test by my name. I want to share my name. I want to you know, share what I've done, what I said with the people around you, just like a fisherman go into the sea, whether it's deep sea or shallow sea. What's the reason for the fisherman going into the sea? Not just to enjoy the water, but to catch fish. Just like that, Jesus will send you in different places, whether it's a deep place or a shallow place, every corner of this world. And the purpose for that is, I want you to, whom, whomever you will meet there, I want to bring them to my name, bring them to my kingdom, bring them to me. That's the purpose. And last Sunday, um, as you know, we had wonderful speakers, right? Randy and Al Oud. And so I heard really good things about you, you know, about their coming and speaking. And, and honestly, you know, I think it was God, you know, all God, just having them over here. Because I, they are very pretty busy people, obviously. They go all around the world um, to testify the gospel. And they could go other places you know, last Sunday, but they chose to come to our church to speak. And I believe it was God. And they were, as you can tell, very active evangelists. You know, they go all around the world to, to testify the gospel. And their message was clear. John chapter 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, you know, that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So they do something else, right? They spin the ball while they're preaching this gospel. In the meantime, they also shared their message was, in Jesus' name, you will have new life, abundant life, everlasting life. So why don't you share this name? That's your job. Share this name with the people around you. Basically, that was their message. But Randy said something sad, you know, because he said there are more than 95%, 95% of Christians in America never lead another person to Christ. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is a really serious number, more than nine of our percent. And we have to, we must re-examine our lives. Like I said, God is not looking for smart Christian or 
super talented Christian. He's looking for faithful servants. The one who is not ashamed of the gospel, the one who is willing to speak up in the name of Jesus audaciously. Randy said, surely you'll get a pushback once you share that name with others. Some of your friends will push you out of their inner circles. Even you will be excommunicated from your family. For instance, my father, you know, who is a first-generation Christian, you know, my grandparents were not a Christian at the time. My father, you know, through his high school teacher, he came to the Lord. He believed and he wanted to be a pastor. What was the consequence of his belief in Jesus Christ? He was excommunicated from the family. My my grandfather, he he literally expelled him. He beat him, beat him up and expelled him. You're not anymore my family. You know, that's kind of an impact we may face. People will reject you. But Randy said, don't take it personally because people are not rejecting you, but they are rejecting Jesus Christ that is in you. This week, um, I was at the dental clinic. Okay, and and um, I think I never had this wonderful dental cleaning I ever had in my life. <laughs> okay, This is a new facility and she gave so much like i never had this wonderful thorough cleaning you know <laughs> so i was really grateful you know to her like wow she's so nice and so um after her treatment was over on the way out i told her you gave me such a wonderful service so i want to share the treasure that i have i have i have with you and i could literally Tell that her eyes were bigger. You know, she might be expecting a gold or silver <laughs> that I don't have come out of my pocket. But um, but this I this I this is something I said. You know, you know the treasure I'm talking about here is the name of Jesus. I don't know about your religious background, but believe in Him. Try to learn more about Him. Jesus died for your sins. He was risen. In His name, you will have more abundant life here now and forever. He's the best treasure you can have. So you may wonder, what, so what was her response? She did not say a word. <laughs> and I could not know, like, because she was wearing a mask, and I could not even see her face. So I have no idea what was in her mind at the time. Maybe she thought, oh, he's such a weirdo. Or she might, or that message could like you know touch to her heart somehow, but here's the thing: when we share the gospel with some someone, we never know. We never know whether this person is ready heart or hardened heart. But we know our job is to you know keep planting the seed in season or out of season, witnessing Christ. The harvest is full, but the labors are few. God wants you to be faithful to this task to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And, and again, Randy said, you know, now is a time when everyone is coming out of their closet. We Christians must come out of our closet to testify God's words. If you don't stand up for Jesus, you'll fall for anything else. If you don't really speak about this truth of, of the gospel, people, this world will not really know what the truth about the gospel is. And I have to tell you something more specific, something I heard last night, which blew my mind. We all know next Sunday is March 31st, and we all know next Sunday is what? Easter. But it happened to be that March 31st happened to be a different day for you know, many people in the world will celebrate. Do you know what day is? It's an international transgender day of visibility. On this Easter Sunday, come on, people. There will be thousands and, you know, I don't know how many. There will be people just celebrating about this transgender movement. Altering these bo young bodies, injecting these hormones, taking away, you know, the parents, you know, their children from their parents. Once parents teach them something against this transgender propaganda, that's the kind of world we are living in now. And I hear Fairfax County Public School Superintendent, he publicized this is the day that we will start to celebrate transgender 
visibility day on Easter Sunday. I believe we must take it as God's sign. And God's alarm for us to wake up. Wake up, people. Again, everyone is coming out of their closet. They're just raising up their voices. Whatever they believe, it's true. Now is the time we Christians must come out of our closet and be faithful to our task. Amen? Number two, God wants us to be faithful until the end. Paul said here in this scripture, I may finish my course. He's using the image of running the course here. So one quick Im implication would be the need for our resilience, something that might be required when you run for a marathon or long distance miles. If you run, uh, who is a runner here? I've done the long distance run. Like more than, let's say, let's say 5K, 5,000, whoever ran more than 5K. Nobody? Okay. <laughs> all right, come on. Okay, no runners? Okay. Um, all right. But anyway, let's imagine, okay? Let's imagine or think about other people who run a long distance. I'm sure at some point, you may have this feeling of what is called death point or hitting the wall or running high. It is a point when you become out of breath and too tired to continue. You find no strength to press on, but you are ready to collapse and give up. So Paul might be saying here, when he said, finish my course, meaning, you know, I will not give up the task the Lord has given me to preach the gospel. No matter how tired I am, no matter how much I want to give up, but I won't give up. I'll continue. Which reminds me of what Martin Luther King Jr. once said, if I cannot fly, then I'll run. If I can run, then I'll walk. If I can even walk, then I'll crawl. But whatever I do, I'll keep moving forward. I'll never give up. Even if I fail, even if I may be unfruitful in, in sharing the gospel, I'll do it again and again and again to be faithful to my task to share the gospel. And who knows, right? Who knows? We may have the second wind of doing it and finish our course strong and fruitfully. So this verse might be meaning that it's asking us to have this resilience, have the mindset of never giving up, of doing this task. But I want you to take all of us further here to consider the context of Paul using this phrase. You know, it, we only read one verse, right, in chapter 20 of Acts. So if you zoom out and see the whole chapter and before and after, you'll notice that Paul was giving the speech in this very particular moment, which is before his departure to Jerusalem. And what was the reason why Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem? And he wanted to go to Rome, right? So that he can share the gospel with this Rome, people in Rome. And he thought that, you know, I mean, at the time, Rome was the heart of the world, just like Washington, D.C. today. It's like, you know, planting new church in Washington, D.C. or Manhattan, well, hear me this. While Paul was so passionate about going into these places, he also knew it was almost like he's running into fire. He knew that he will face the dangers, persecutions, sufferings, and even death. That's why if you look at chapter 20 and 21, you'll find other Christian friends deterring Paul. Paul, do you really have to do this? Paul, do you really need to go to Jerusalem and Rome? You're going to die. Please reconsider. There can be some other ways you can preach the gospel here with us. But Paul insisted. He believed in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is really leading him to that direction. So when he said here, finishing my course is not just referring to a resilience, but rather it means I'll seal this task with my life, with my death. I'll even risk my life to preach the gospel. I'm not going into the world you know, as much as I can. I'm not preaching the gospel to somebody you know, as much as I can save my face. I can save my life. No, finishing my course here doesn't, it's not, it's referring to that. 
I'm willing to seal my testimony, seal my task, even with my life. That explains his speech clear when he said, I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. And please don't misunderstand, because Paul is not neglecting or he think life that God has given us is invaluable or worthless. No, it's, it's valuable. It's precious. But compared to his knowing of Christ, compared to his witnessing of Christ, compared to earning Christ, he can even say, I can account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. The cost of our, the cost of our faithfulness to witness Jesus Again, it's not just part of our life. It's not just part of our money. It's not part of our time, but all of ourselves. When God calls us to be faithful to witness Christ, He wants us to seal this task with everything we have, even with our death. Listen to what Jesus said. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. For whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in glory of the Father, and he will repay each person according to what he has done. So what does it mean to be faithful to Jesus? First, we are faithful to the task of testifying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second, we are faithful to this task even unto our death. Third and, third and last, we can and we should be faithful by God's faithfulness. Say with me, I can be faithful by God's faithfulness. Speaking of faithfulness, this is something we need to be very careful about. Because you don't want to anchor your faithfulness in yourself. You don't want to do that because you fail, right? One day you get sick. You get exhausted. You get discouraged. You fail. You stumble. That's who we are. Somebody said this, and I believe it's so true, that we are half step away from being stupid at any moment. <laughs> in other words, we are half step away from failing to be faithful at any moment. So we should never put our trust in ourselves as if we could. I could do this. We should never think as if we are the fourth person of the Trinity God. We have to admit our incapability. That's why we need to have a contrite heart all the time. God saying like, God, I'm broken. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every time I need thee. That hunger, that thirst, that broken heart is the mark of the true Christian. We cannot finish this course by our natural power. We need the supernatural power. That's why we need to trust in the Lord and ask his help. Not once in a while, but without ceasing. Our identity must be in only found in Jesus. And our faithfulness should be only found in Jesus. And after all, that's the gospel. And what is the gospel? God is, gospel is what God has done for us, right? Jesus died for us, yet we, when we were sinners. We are saved, not because of our works or our faithfulness, but because of God's faithfulness to us. So our faithfulness is not a prerequisite for our salvation, but it's a byproduct of God's faithfulness. As the scripture goes, we love God. Why? Because God first loved us. We are willing to be faithful because God has been faithful to us first. We are capable of being faithful only when we let God be God in and among us. Only by God's faithfulness and his power, you and I can be faithful to our task. Seal it with our life. Because God is in me. We can run our race to the finish line. That's why Jesus said, abide in me. Apart from me, you can what? Do nothing. Abide in me. So this is how I want to wrap up this message today. I want to encourage my Christian brothers and sisters, whom I dearly love, everybody here, I love you. 
I want to hold on to these three words together. Know, abide, share. Let us know Jesus Christ more. Let us more enthusiastically abide in Jesus Christ. And let us share this name of Jesus Christ so that you can be that faithful servant. I can be that faithful servant. And we can be that faithful church and make our God smile. Remember, it's faithfulness, not success. Not success. Faithfulness, not success. Well, let us pray. God, you have been so faithful to us. Holy Spirit, help us to be faithful to you as well, our Father. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We'll say, Amen.